How's it going you guys? So in this video I'm just going to be discussing the basics of strength and conditioning for combat sports, mixed martial arts, jiu-jitsu, grappling. So first and foremost, uh, the number one thing is you do want to lift weights, but you want to lift weights to make your overall body as strong as possible. Okay. So ideally you want to work in the one to five rep ranges. Okay. And you want to lift as heavy as you can um, and as close as you can to your max effort for that rep range with the given sets that you have that you can actually recover from. So it's going to depend on your level of fitness and your level of advancement within the strength training spectrum. Okay. Um, the reason why you want to train uh, in the one to five, sometimes eight rep range, you want to go heavy with heavy weights on full body movements, the squat, the deadlift, the power clean, if you could catch it in a front rack position properly, the overhead press, different variations of bench press, chest press, floor press. The reason why you wanna do this is because, um, so you're not a bodybuilder. Bodybuilders train in the eight to 12, sometimes 20 rep range. That's way too many reps. It's gonna make you way too sore. It's gonna to build too much soreness. It's going to cause muscle damage. That's what hypertrophy is for. What what muscle training is for? Bodybuilding training. Higher reps, they're more in tune with um, getting muscles bigger, causing more muscle damage, causing more soreness, and getting a pump. Whereas training in the one to five rep ranges uh, with maximum strength for maximum effort is actually training maximum force production. Everything you do as a martial artist as a combat sports athlete, especially for grappling, is going to be about producing force and resisting force, okay? So first of all, at a baseline level of understanding, when you are getting kimura in jiu-jitsu, someone's trying to take your arm off with a submission, you're trying your best to resist force. That person's pressing your arm down, you gotta resist it with all your might. When you do, if you, take your 100, if you take your overhead press from 100 pounds to 200 pounds, that's an extreme, that's going to give you an extreme advantage to escaping Kimuras. Of course, you can't just extend your arm to escape a Kimura submission. You've got to also roll out of there and know the escape. But your ability to escape from Kimuras, especially when someone already is almost has it locked in, uh, it's going to depend, depend on how much you can resist that, that submission. So your ability to escape submissions um, is going to be incredibly dependent on how much force production you can, uh, how much force you can resist. Remember, we're talking about resistance training. So training properly to resist the maximum amount of force is, is paramount to your success in combat sports. The entire um, sports game, the entire game surrounding combat sports is resisting the opponent's force, okay? When somebody is uh, going for a takedown, your ability to resist that takedown, obviously technique is first, knowing how to do it is first, but the amount of force that you can resist and also the amount of force you can produce is going to play a role in how successful you are at defending a takedown, at defending submissions, uh, at hip bumping someone off of you, um, at hip escaping, um, at uh, breaking someone's guard, and, and also at getting submissions and things like that too. Um, actually executing a takedown is emphasizing your force production, how much force you can produce. Also, how much you can explode, okay? Explosive capacity, your capacity for power and explosion. Also, you train that with training your force production. So think of force production as raising your ceiling, okay, the capacity that you have for generating power. So, um, you know, someone who doesn't understand exercise science doesn't look at it like this, but um, from a scientific perspective, you can produce um, force in numbers. They can actually measure it, okay? They can measure it. And if you, the more force you can produce um, by training your maximum force with strength training, the more power you'll be able to produce, okay? With not only with obviously power exercises, things like plyometrics and, you know, um, power cleans and things, but 
literally just training your sport explosively, okay, you can become more explosive over time if your ceiling for force production increases and you can only train that ceiling for force production through, through properly conducted strength training. Okay, so now we got that out of the way. One to five rep range for, for strength training exercises. You want full body movement because everything you do in your sport is full body. So that's again, barbell squats, barbell overhead press, dumbbell overhead press is fine. Barbell chest press or bench press or dumbbell. Floor press is probably even better for combat sports. Overhead press is great because you're standing on your feet. Uh, you're, you're driving from the foot up, which is how all um, you know athletic movements are created. You're generating force from your foot uh, all the way from the ground up. Um, and you need to be training with heavy weights. Like I see way too many people. So I heard boxing coaches that I've had, they say, oh, you want to be doing, you know, really light weights for sets of 20 to 40 to build your endurance for boxing. That's not how punch power or punch endurance is developed. Uh, for boxing, doing a lot of running will definitely increase your endurance for boxing. Heavy bag rounds will increase your lactic capacity, um, which is the ability to you know, do multiple explosions and multiple high intensity bursts without oxygen. Um, but running is going to create, increase your overall capacity to do everything within that window allotted. Um, but strength training, you know, doing weights for light reps for high, all that's going to do is get you tired. It's going to turn your arms into spaghetti. It's going to generate a lot of lactic acid to where you're so sore that you can't show up to boxing practice the next day. So, High, high reps is not the ticket for combat sports. That's going to make you tight, it's going to make you tired, and it's going to make you slow. Um, believe it or not, doing sets of one to five, because it's not, because, it's not the speed in which you move the bar in, in this context, it's the amount of force you generate into that bar. Okay, You're not training fighting in the gym. You're training maximum uh, attributes. You're training your body's capacity to generate more force through strength training. So not only will you be able to generate more force, which will help you execute uh, submissions. Trust me, uh, your ability to execute a Kimura is, is going to improve when you're stronger. Your ability to fight off a Kimura when you're stronger is going to improve. Um, but also your ability your injury, how prone you are to injury. You have people like Jocko Willink, who's like a high-level uh, Jiu-Jitsu black belt, trained under Roy Dean and uh, ja John Danahar, and uh, he says strength conditioning every day because uh, that's his injury prevention. He, he says that he knows the, the more he does strength conditioning, the less he gets injured. That's because he does it properly. Um, and that's exactly true because the stronger your joints are and the stronger the muscles are around that joint, uh, the more resistance you build to injury. And I see so many people get injured at my jiu-jitsu school and I have over time in MMA too. It's always the guys who don't do strength and conditioning. Not, and there are obviously people who also get injured during strength and conditioning uh, or, or they get injured that do strength and conditioning. The most dangerous thing though that you can do is your actual sport, just so you guys know. A lot of people, they do jujitsu every single day, they go super hard, and then like they, they start to build up injuries over time because they don't properly periodize their weeks uh, into light, medium, and harder days. Um, and then the strength and conditioning could take the place of some of their, their off days too, maybe some active recovery or something like that. Anyway, so, um, you need to be lifting sets of one to five, uh, getting stronger, generating more force, and then making sure that you're training your actual sport on a regular basis, obviously. And when you're training your sport, um, you know, at least when you're getting ready for competition, you need to start rolling with more strength as you get ready for competition because you can only fight how you train. And so going into the gym and training strength is building your body's uh, ability to produce more strength and more force. Then when you're actually uh, rolling and you're getting ready for competition, okay, you don't want to be hurting your, your partners and things, right? 
don't want to be hurting your team. But you need to start practicing that those strength attributes. You'll notice you'll have more of an ability to finish submissions because you're stronger, more of an ability to fight out of submissions because you're stronger, more of an ability to resist various different things because you're stronger. Your ability to actually execute takedowns are stronger. You'll literally feel like you can manhandle certain people because you're stronger. Um, so you've got to up the intensity, up the strength as you get closer to your competition because in competition, your strength is going to matter the most. I heard people say that strength does not win points. It's absolutely true. Being able to retain certain, posi uh, certain positions. Um, yeah, strength doesn't earn points, but, uh, the ability to, to, to maintain certain positions in jujitsu earns points. The abil ability to get submissions wins matches. The ability to resist submissions prevents you from losing matches. So here's the thing, maintaining different positions. Number one, it's technique is obviously body awareness is obviously experience. But think about when you have someone in, in, in back mount and you got the hooks in. Uh, if you're real strong, if, you're, if you built strength, do you think it's going to help you or hinder you or not have any impact? Obviously, skill and experience are, are big, leveraging and all that thing, all that. But being able to bear hug the crap out of someone and, keep, and having stronger grips, having stronger grips in jujitsu. Is that, is that really not going to help you? You can actually build your, your, your grip strength through strength training. Um, and, and to a significant degree. And not to mention your, the muscles of your grip go all the way up into your bicep and into your, into your shoulder. You train all of these muscles responsible for maintaining grip through strength training. Also, if these muscles are lacking, your grip's going to have to do more work. So training your entire body as a unit on a regular basis will help to reserve a lot of the fatigue in your grip and it'll actually help to improve the strength of your grip. And you'll be able to hold submission, you'll be able to hold positions longer to maintain more points to prevent other people from scoring on you. It's crazy that people like talk down on strength training in regards to martial arts performance, especially in grappling. Um, and I think a big part of it is that, you know, on the strength training side, you know, I guess that there's people who think that strength training is like number one. I don't know. Uh, I think the biggest reason is that it's just that m pretty most people don't understand um, the science behind strength training, how it work, how it improves martial arts performance and what strength training does or those adaptations. Um, and I, and I, and like bodybuilding gives strength training a bad rep, I guess. Um, so on top of, uh, on top of strength training, okay. On top of strength training for, um, martial arts performance, you also need, uh, conditioning. So you can get a lot of your conditioning from rolling on a regular basis, but depending on how you roll and, and, you're, and what school you're, you're, you're at, what, you, what your gym does, you might get more banged up too. Um, now your soreness is going to decrease over time. The longer you've done a certain type of training, the less sore you get over time. But um, you can also train um, your conditioning through scientific principles. So. First of all, you have your aerobic capacity. Aerobic capacity is going to be steady state cardio, like jogging, bicycling, swimming for about 20 minutes minimum up to about 45 minutes. And that's going to basically, that's going to be training your body's ability to use oxygen as an energy source. Um, and I think most people should be doing this, uh, you know, anywhere from two to five days a week. I think ideally, four to five days a week of aerobic capacity work is perfect. So that's just jogging, even walking for long distances, depending on your fitness level. And the thing is, you can also use this to help you recover. So aerobic capacity work, this long distance so you say cardio is also going to help you to uh, lower your, your body's lactic acid. Like if you feel sore, it'll help to break up some of the soreness, promote blood flow, throughout the body and it's going to help you relax and feel better and recover faster. 
So strength and conditioning is, is very important. Um, or, you know, aerobic capacity work is very important for that. Um, so then on top of that, you have, uh, you have a lactic capacity training. So a lactic capacity training is going to be your body's ability to, um, to, to explode over and over again for repeated bouts. So, um, a lactic is basically, um, intensity without the lactic buildup. Okay. So I believe aerobic training tends to break up a lot of lactic acids, mostly oxidate oxidation. Um, a lactic is like, um, you know, you do circuits. Let's say you have six sets uh, of three reps and you have, you know, multiple rounds. Okay. So let's see, let's say you do like a squat jump for six sets of three reps. Okay. And you take, um, 10 to 20 seconds in between each set. That's not a lot of uh, rest in between, but it's much different than if you do like 20 squat jumps with no rest. So three squat jumps, rest, you know, 20 seconds and then repeat that six times. Then you do, you know, three, maybe five different exercises, different different exercises. Then you move on to, um, explosive pushups, you know, three reps, take a 20 minute break, repeat, or sorry, a 20 second break. <laughs> And repeat that six times and you keep doing that and what that's going to do is repeat your ability for explosion over and over again so let's say um jumping guard followed by uh you know a technical get up and then you know moving around more okay you're going to be less gas the more you train your alactic capacity from these small explosive movements um then you have lactic capacity which is your capacity building your capacity to um, do high intensity scrambles that build up lactic acid um, and then recover from that in between. So that would be something like um, a scramble, like when you're like you're grappling or whatever, you're scrambling for, for a, uh, you're struggling to get a takedown and, and uh, let's say you and the other person are constantly like back and forth transitioning and and fighting off uh, a submission, fighting off a takedown back and forth with no rest. And then y'all return to base and to, uh, where you started fighting for the takedown, you know, or let's say you're, you're uh, in a brawl, like in a uh, kick and a uh, Muay Thai or something. And it's just like trading shots back and forth against the cage or against the wall, or you're, you're in a, uh, a clinch and you're fighting for a dominant position, throwing knees and stuff like that. Um, you know, so lots and lots of high intensity movements within 30 seconds, um, you know, up to a minute sometimes, and then followed by a, a rest period where both of you are kind of like taking the intensity down a little bit. So to train a lactic capacity, you would do something like 30, 30 seconds on 30 seconds off of some kind of uh, high intensity movement. So that could be like, you know, um, 20 box jumps over and over again followed by a, an equivalent um, break or something like a heavy bag, a hundred, uh, like one minute on and then like one minute off all out heavy bag. Um, and then if, as you, as your fitness level improves and, you, and that gets easier and easier, you decrease the rest period over time. That's going to build your, your ability to, for, for that um, explosive high intensity bout uh, with, less and less rest in between to eventually where your VO2 max increases so much that you can just do high intensity for way longer without let, without rest. Um, so that'll, that'll, um, kind of indirectly increase your aerobic capacity. So ideally you do the a lactic capacity, you know, one to three times a week. Um, the aerobic capacity, you know, three to five times a week, ideally four to five. And then the um, lactic capacity, a lot of people probably could only do like once a week. I'd say up to about three times a week is probably ideal, you know. And then, um, you know, keep in mind when you do your hard jujitsu rolling and your live training, you're going to be training um, a lot of aerobic capacity, but a lot of that's going to be lactic capacity. So you're going to get a lot of lactic capacity work as a competitive athlete. 
and you're probably not going to need a whole lot of lactic capacity training, but once a week just training that specifically is probably a good idea. But overall, keep in mind, the main point here is you're training in the gym to make your body stronger overall. That's the characteristic you're building. Or you're training in the gym to build an energy system, to build more endurance through endurance exercise, more explosion through explosive circuits and exercises. You're not going to the gym to make your punch stronger by shadow boxing with 10 pound weights or by getting a cable and like doing an explosive punch over and over again. All it's going to do is create overuse injuries. It's going to be a waste of time and it might make you tired, give you a good workout. You might feel more functional or something like that, but it's not going to actually contribute towards metabolic shifts and changes in your body that produce you know, significant differences, you know. And um, just to throw it out there, um, we have Phil DeRue, uh, who used to train at American Top Team, trained uh, professional boxers, professional wrestlers, uh, not professional wrestlers, Olympic wrestlers, uh, MMA fighters like Dustin Poirier and uh, Joanna Zhivijinchink, can't pronounce her name. Um, the, high, the highest caliber UFC fighters, professional boxers, you name it, uh, Phil Drew has trained them and he's done, you know, he has his own methods based on West Side uh, barbell, but he does different types of uh, strength movements with the barbell. He also trains a lack capacity, lack capacity, and he trains concurrently all at the same time building these different energy systems. Um, and he's doing, you know, maximum strength and dynamic strength and power using barbells, something that a lot of coaches say is, you know, not good and blah, 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 you know. And then you have uh, Chad Wesley Smith, who's trained some of the highest caliber jujitsu athletes. And he's been doing this for like over 10 years now. And he has a lot of videos on his channel that you should probably check out about how to train for jujitsu. And he's trained Buchecha, if I pronounce that properly, who's like one of the greatest jujitsu fighters, um, of the last like, I don't know, five years or something. And uh, a wide variety of black belt level world champions. Um, and a lot of these people, they, they are on record saying that they wish that they would have done strength and conditioning sooner. The problem is most people don't know how strength and conditioning works. And so they just think it's a waste of time, it promotes injury, all this shit. And then when they get to the highest level, they realize they're at a pretty big disadvantage, unless you're Marcelo Garcia, maybe, uh, if you don't do strength and conditioning. So, um, if there's Phil DeRue, there is um, Chad Wesley Smith, there's even Mike Isretel, who I made a debunking video, because he had it wrong on keto, but he, he has it right as far as strength and conditioning to an extent. I think he kind of buys in this idea that you can't train two energy systems at once. But, um, you know, he is a purple belt. He's done, like, uh, tournaments that he's won. You know, he's been doing jiu for a long time. He's also a PhD. He has a PhD in exercise science. He has a video about uh, mixing lifting and jiu-jitsu and some of the trade-offs associated with it. It doesn't really talk a lot about some of the benefits of strength and conditioning for jiu-jitsu, but, um, you know, that's probably, you know, so he, he also... Practices both, and you have um, you have I can't pronounce the name, Siam Nisam Yang or something like that. Um, he's on Mark Bell's Power Podcast, who mixes strength and conditioning. He used to be a professional powerlifter with Jiu Jitsu, and he's also done grappling tournaments with Chad Le Wesley Smith. Chad Wesley Smith is uh, winning some tournaments now too, and he's got one of the most successful strength and conditioning businesses uh, around right now. Uh, then you have Josh Bryant, who's written the book, um, what is it, um, is it Grapple Strong? I think it's called Grapple Strong, and it's a complete book about training and conditioning for grappling, for Olympic wrestling, jiu-jitsu, sambo, judo, and it has real-world examples, and it breaks down the, the science of it all. Then you have Eric, I can't remember his last name, but he also has a book out. And uh, I think that's called Roll, is it called Roll Strong? I forgot what it's called, Roll Stronger, I think is what it's called. 
And I'm, I'm not really as big of a fan of that book, but maybe I didn't give it as much of a chance. But I do like his posts on Instagram. And he bases a lot of his work off of the late, great Charles Polquin. And, um, you know, he is one of the greatest strength and conditioning coaches in his own right. Charles Parkwin, at least. And this guy, Eric, uh, seems to train a lot of higher level athletes as well. And he's a purple belt himself. So there's a lot of different uh, people to choose from that teach proper strength and conditioning for martial arts. The biggest reason why strength training is not um, promoted in martial arts and is talked down upon is because, number one, like, People want an excuse to take the easy road. I understand that. And people don't want to do their sport. Um, so coaches are scared that you're going to like waste your time on strength training and not, and not go to your jiu-jitsu training. So that's a problem, obviously. you got to do your, your skill training first. The second problem is that they just don't understand training and conditioning. If you look at a lot of high-level high jiu-jitsu black belts in your gym, they're skinny, lanky guys. Um, so, first of all, that's, I mean, obviously, Marcelo Garcia, there's a lot of examples of guys who've gone to world class levels without strength and conditioning uh, or without lifting weights or whatever. So, it's, it's not like you need to lift weights, it's just that it does perhaps provide an advantage. You know, you could go all the way to black belt, never lifted a weight in your life, don't understand exercise science or anything like that. You just do jiu-jitsu real well and you understand jiu-jitsu. And you might even beat a lot of guys who do strength and conditioning that are black belts. But that doesn't, that's not a re, that's, does not mean that weight training is a waste of time. does not mean that strength training does not give you an advantage. Um, it, it just means that, you know, there's different attributes in, in uh, strength tr or different attributes in every sport. You know, conditioning and endurance is vitally important. Strength helps a lot. Um, but obviously having experience and skill. And the other thing is if you're not strong, over time, you learn how to adapt to that. If you roll with a lot of stronger guys, you develop your own variations of different techniques and escapes and things and you learn ways of getting of escaping submissions without needing strength so strength training gives you an advantage but you can learn to adapt to jujitsu without needing strength so you know and I, I don't know if i already said it in this video because i've tried making this video multiple times but i've heard one of my coaches say that um strength does not gain points in competition. Strength doesn't win you points. But the fact is, what makes you win points? Um, so, uh, passing guard, which being stronger can help you pass guard a little bit easier. Um, let's see, sweeping makes you win points. Being stronger can help you sweep. Uh, can help you successfully gain sweeps, especially if they're not in proper position. Position before submission, position before transition. But being stronger helps you uh, gain sweeps, helps you pass someone's guard. Um, what about uh, if, you're in, if you're in back mount and you got someone in rear naked choke position? You be able to get the hooks in and you be able to maintain those positions um, a lot easier the stronger you are. Um, what about uh, submission? Someone who's like got you in a Kimura and they're about to rip your, your arm off. The more force that you can resist, that you train through strain training, the more force you can resist, the easier it will be for you to escape that Kimura and potentially risk losing that match. Like if you can't fight off that Kimura, you can, it, then you can't roll out of it and gain a more dominant position. So fighting off that Kimura or whatever joint lock it is, strength training helps tremendously and that could, that could literally make or break the match. So. You could easily prevent loss by being strong in those positions. What about um, actually attacking an arm and getting a Kimura? Um, so fighting for a Kimura is a lot, a lot of that's based on how much someone can resist that joint lock. The stronger you are, the more force you can produce to actually get that joint lock successfully. So you need your skill training first and foremost, but being stronger helps tremendously with whatever technique and skill you have. So um, the point here is 
you know, and then what about um, conditioning and endurance? Okay, you can have all the technique in the world, but if you gas out after two rounds of rolling, like I do right now because I haven't been training as consistently, um, let's say you're rolling and you're completely gassed. You, don't ha you can't produce enough oxygen. You can't utilize enough oxygen to be able to, to escape the different positions and things, regardless of how skilled or experienced you are. Um, without being able, with, with, when you're out of breath, you're done, okay? Um, and someone's going to be able to inflict their will on you no matter how skilled you are. That's just the way it is. Um, you know, and a good way to, to put it, and this is extreme, but still, let's say somebody, let's say your nose is completely clogged up from allergies. That's terrible. No, no skill in the world is going to allow you to really get through that um, unless your life's on the line and you can just, you know, I mean, that's just extreme example, but you should know where I'm going with that already. So, yeah, strength and conditioning matters, and um, it, it's just like, it's dumb to say that it doesn't matter, okay? Um, obviously, skill matters, but strength and conditioning gives you an extreme advantage, and people who don't have strength, uh, enough, um, at least endurance or conditioning, let alone strength, because remember, the stronger you are, um, the less energy it takes out of you to do certain things. Fighting, fighting an arm bar is going to be a max effort attempt for a lot of people and take a lot out of it um, just because fighting at your arm through or whatever it is. Like, that's another thing. Fighting at your arm through to get both arms in to break an arm bar. Um, that's literally like doing a dip or a chest press, okay? So the stronger you are at that, the, the less map, the less effort it takes to get your arm through and the more the more um, oxygen you've reserved to do the rest of the match so you know what you what used to be like incredibly difficult for people to do getting your arm through and defending the arm bar is now submaximal and these are all things that no one thinks about because they don't train strength and they don't understand strength training they don't read exercise science and, you know, the thing is, you again, you can go your entire career, become a black belt in jiu-jitsu and not know exercise science. And you'd be like, oh, strength doesn't win you points. No, like, it just makes you sore. It doesn't have any benefit. Blah, blah, blah. You know, and, that, and it's like, you're great at what you do at jiu-jitsu, but you're completely ignorant to how strength and exercise actually can have an advantage and actually works. You don't even know what you're talking about as far as in the conditioning. But you think that because you're so, you know, you, you're a high rank, you're a black belt or whatever in your sport, you think that you know what you're talking about. And you're right that skill is the number one most important thing, but, and you have experience with that, but you have no experience with strength and conditioning or how it applies to sport. And pretty much, it, like the majority of people 75% of people who are doing jiu-jitsu don't do strength and conditioning. Now, again, a lot of people will be like, oh, well, isn't that a great example of why strength and conditioning isn't that important? And it's like, no, it's a great example of why training your sport is the number one most important thing. But just because, you know, 75% of people don't do strength and conditioning doesn't mean that those 75% of people couldn't have benefited from it. <laughs> um, so, and it, what, what I see is, oh, 75% of people that are in your jiu-jitsu class don't do strength and conditioning. 90% of them don't understand how to do strength and conditioning, even if they did it. And what I see is the small percentage of people who do understand strength and conditioning, and they do it, are going to be, are going to have an extreme advantage over the rest of them. So, anyway, as a strength and conditioning professional, as I am, uh... My main goal should be to use the science that I know <laughs> at, and be an example of why strength and conditioning actually helps. And be an example is in still training my sport, doing the skills and all that that's necessary, but um, also, you know, using the strength when it is uh, required, you know. Um, and I think people, they think of like strength. Uh, you know, when you think of strength, they think of just like, you know, trying to bench press someone off you. That, that's not necessarily 
what it's about. People think of that, but no, it's the skills you give me are now easier because I'm stronger. <laughs> so anyway, um, leave that, leave your question comments down below and I'll talk to y'all next time.